You're now listening to Hack and Grow Rich with Shaheen Shayan and his co-host, Bart Baggett, where we discuss hacking your way to success and the unconventional paths to unreasonable success with the people who've been there. And now, the author of Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult, Shaheen Shayan. Hey, 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 everybody. This is the Hack and Grow Rich podcast. My name is Bart Baggett. My co-host with me, the master hacker of Amazon, the hacker of the pill culture, and future best-selling author, Cheyenne Cheyenne. Brother, welcome to the show. It's been fun so far this last couple of years. Yeah, it's been great. This is our first show of the year, and thanks for being on with me again this year as we start up another exciting year 2022 of Hack and Grow Rich, my co-host for you guys who don't know him, Bart Baggett, success coach extraordinaire to the rich and happy. So make sure you check out his stuff uh, as we move in this beautiful January 2022. I'm in Los Angeles. Bart, where, where are you at now? I'm in my studio in Dallas, Texas. And um, we, we just actually uh, got a lease on another studio in Los Angeles. So I'll be bouncing around the country quite a bit, doing a lot more podcasts. I just outlined and uh, created a brand new part, podcast called Bart Baggett's Smart Show. So we're going to talk about smart things with smart people about the dumb world. It's going to be a blast. And uh, I really love doing your show whenever possible. And I got a shout out to you. You were absolutely brilliant on dropping bombs with Brad Leia. And that is a cool dude in a cool studio. And I think you hit a home run. And you want to talk a little bit about that because because you told some stories that I've heard before, but I don't think you've ever shown them in one show. And man, that was that was amazing. Yeah, I appreciate that. For you guys who have not seen the show, check it out. It's Brad Lee Podcast. He spells it L-E-A. Super cool dude out of Las Vegas. He works with Grant Cardone and some of the great uh, internet marketers of our age. His name is Brad Lee, and I did a podcast with him called Dropping Bombs. Uh, we'll also eventually share it on the Hack and Grow Rich channel, but right now you can check it out on Brad Lee's site uh, and also on his YouTube channel. But that was super fun. You know, Brad Lee's folks uh, – Agreed to have us on. I went down to Vegas. I had a super cool time with them. And it, it's it's amazing how some parts of the country are a lot more chill with COVID than California. California seems to be deeply concerned about what's happening right now in almost what may seem to some people unreasonable. I don't want to get too much into politics or or any of that stuff on this show. But – it's just interesting to note the differences where I was in Arizona not too long ago and they definitely don't care about COVID there. Like people look at you strange in Texas and in Arizona. I know you're in Texas. How are things there with it? Well, you know, I, I've been in LA for 19 years and I still have a place there, but I, I left because I felt so restrictive. I mean, I couldn't do stand up comedy. I couldn't get on the clubs. I couldn't go to house parties. Like it was, it was a, felt a little bit like a communist country. And I had this really interesting conversation with the previous ambassador to China. Okay, this is Saturday night. Fascinating guy. He was there in China for many, many years. And he said that when the COVID outbreak came in, like they just lock the town up because they can. It's a totalitarian government, right? And they're like, you can't leave your house. And so they squashed that thing in two weeks because people wow. have given up their freedom in exchange for communism, right? And it was interesting because it can be handled with quarantines, but not with half quarantines. And so what he was saying is so fascinating because you know he's, he's a retired governor. And he said that in America, it's so fascinating because every state is still its little country. So when I go yeah. from California to Texas to, to Nashville, it's like a different country. And I think if you're watching from India, it doesn't feel that way because it all looks like the same crazies doing stuff in politics. But our federal government is kind of, kind of a strung together a series of states, United States. And so it's really fascinating. So you go state to state. And so that is one reason I'm spending more time in Texas is I have more freedom here. We have more freedom to produce movies and films and, and, and see stuff and do comedy. And it's very interesting how the local politicians are profoundly affecting the lifestyles, which leads actually into our topic. And I'm not a strongly political person, but I am strongly aligned with certain capitalist values. And I think the topic we're going to talk about is that sort of possibility of, of what's more important, you know, yourself 
being self-absorbed, taking care of your family, maybe building a legacy? Or is more important, is it investing in your community and building a community around you? Or is your country more important? And how did you phrase it when you, when you were sending me a text this morning about our show? Well, I thought we would talk a little bit today about legacy and why that's important and why I think what's missing now, particularly we talk about it a lot, like with woke culture, with TikTok culture, where things are, are, are fed to a 15-second attention span that melts your brain rather than trying to think deeper into nuance is that the thinking of getting rich quick and like everybody else, I like getting rich and there's no better way to get rich than quick. But when all we do is focus on that and all we do is focus on, on chasing money in that way, we lose the foundational wealth that the ones who came before us believed in. And that's what it's really about. It's about legacy and legacy thinking. So let me share something with you that I think might be interesting. And okay, there we go. So I'm going to share my screen. It's the first time I've used this platform to share screen. So I'm very excited about it. So what do you see there, Bart? I see mummies. I see toot and common of color right. and black and white. That's right. And I believe that was one of the more famous of the pharaohs in Egypt uh, before, let's call it year zero. Sometimes exactly. between when the earth started and year zero. That's my best guess. <laughs> I think he I think he reigned somewhere in the 1000 BCE era, but sure. So there's a new documentary on Nat Geo. I think you can get it on Disney Plus. And it's the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun, which at its time was one of the greatest archaeological finds, arguably to this day, one of the, the greatest archaeological finds of all time, kind of like real Indiana Jones stuff. It's real Raiders of the Lost Ark, real like those dudes were old school explorers with the leather jackets and the hats, and they all had that khaki shirt that you wear. You can't be an explorer without that khaki old school Banana Republic shirt. And what they've done is it's fascinating is that they've taken – they've used this crack team of European film uh, restorers, and they've taken this black and white footage from 1920s, and it's beautiful footage from like 1922, and they've cleaned it up. They've made it 4K, and they've added color to it, and you think, so what? You think, so what? Like, really, that's the thing? And then you look at it, and you're like, holy shit. Like, look at how much more information is just in color in these. And I'm going somewhere with this, so, 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 so stay with me. And I use this because it is probably the most famous if you ask people about Egypt and Egyptology, which I am obsessed with. Not that I'm knowledgeable about, but so, – Before you move on, let me ask you that question because I don't know the answer. If you're taking a 35-millimeter photograph, can you really extract it to 4K or is it a, a kind of an electronic version of 4K? Oh, God, I don't know. That's a technical question for those nerds that are on that so show. So it's just beautiful. It makes it look alive and vibrant and as if you were there in 1905. Yes, and you get to see the details. You can see so much more information. And these guys didn't just use an app to colorize it. By the way, there's a few apps that are mind-blowing. Uh, that colorized black and white photos. This is not using AI. This is not that. These guys went and they saw the actual items and they matched the colors and then they went wow. in by hand and colored each frame to those colors. So this would be as close as you can get to what it was like in 1925. So the guy's name was Carter to, to be in his presence and see him uncovering this great mystery. Now, you're looking at the, the sarcophagus of King Tut, and they found the storage room, right? So this is like this dude's storage room from 3,500 years ago. They stuffed the stuff in here. They didn't expect dude to die that young. He died young. He was a boy king. And they just stuffed all this stuff in this room, and then it was virtually undisturbed for a good part right here of 3,500 years. So it's like – 
dude, here's a key. And there was, there was a, a, a lock on the door and the seal. And like, it was all like, they, they put this stuff in a room. And then the next guy that opened it was 3,500 years later. How mind blowing is that? Now, we're going to get into this, but this is, gets even more interesting. And here's, you know, here's colorized images of Carter opening up the, the door and, you know, like the stuff that's in there. I mean, this looks like something that was, you know, put in a storage room 20 years ago from a garage sale. It doesn't look like, uh, you know, it doesn't look like something that was from 3,500 years ago. So this is what's interesting. So this guy finds the after, – after a year after his discovery of the tomb, finally he gets permission and politics and all the stuff to open up this sarcophagus. And inside a gold-crusted sarcophagus, there are like several other sarcophagi. Is that the plural? We'll go with sarcophagi. Several other sarcophaguses inside. Now, by the time he gets to like the second or third one – he realizes that it's no longer like gold plated with 24 karat gold. It is solid fucking gold. It's a solid gold case for a dude. This dude was buried in multiple gold cases with a shit ton of gold shit. Like, look at this. There's a fucking, this dude, you know, like back in these days, these guys rode around in chariots. Like chariots were actually how wars were fought in those days. There's, I don't know if you could see it in here, but there's like a gold chariot. You don't see it in these pictures, but there's like a literal solid gold chariot that dude used to ride around on saying, I'm the king. This is my gold chariot. And then he gets buried in a solid gold human size box layered into three other boxes. Now, why is this interesting? Okay. Let's talk about legacy thinking. And by the way, look, these are, these are the images here. You can see Carter with his helper and then their, uh, you know, they're, they're slowly taking this black tar stuff that they put to preserve this in there. 3,500 years ago, these guys figured out what chemical they have to put on this. So when they open it 3,500 years later, that it's perfect and looks new. So this guy's taking it off. But look at it in color. Do you see how much more you see in the color one? Like it's, it's insane. It's so detailed. It's so detailed. All right. So all that aside, here's the interesting thing. People – Look at this and they go, oh, my God, what an egomaniac. What a, you know, how ostentatious, how gaudy, how you know, all this. I showed it to uh, a guy that I'm uh, mentoring, a young kid. And he said, oh, my God, what an egomaniac. I said, quite on the contrary. And let me explain why. Here's the reason why. The reason why is this. The Egyptians believed as part of their, their holy, sacred religion that each man lived once but had two deaths. The first death happened when your body died. And it could happen through war, disease. You could get hit by a, by a chariot or whatever. See what I did? It's supposed to be bus. Um, <laughs> you, could get, you could get hit by something. Something could happen and you leave your body. Fair enough. The second death, which is even more interesting, happens when the last person to remember your name dies or forgets your name. And this was written in the hieroglyphs. So what are they doing here? Why would a pharaoh, a king, somebody who is at his height that could use this wealth for enriching himself and his people during that time go through such pains to build a solid gold sarcophagus. Even in those days, gold was not easy to come by. Why? The answer is legacy. Because they were legacy thinking. It's that second death. As we sit here on this podcast today, as I'm mentioning his name to you, he has not yet died. We think these were primitive people. We think 3,500 years ago, we think these were, these, were, these were real primitive people, and they did not understand death. Oh, they understood it. They weren't no dummies. These guys had surgery, advanced medicine. They, there was even an article I read some time ago where they had invented a fucking battery. Like, I don't know how they did this, but there's some device that they found out there that's like every, 
engineer you show it to is like, this is a fucking battery. They don't know how you lit it up. Maybe you had to put it out for get lightning or something. But these guys were super high tech. You look at the shit they built. They built amazing cities, stuff that that rivals anything that was built today in its scale and scope of detail. Maybe it's not as technologically advanced, but it was for its time incredibly advanced. So they understood that when the body dies, it dies. They were no dummies. They didn't think that you you could come back to life or they didn't have those stories. Not in this world, at least. They had their, their mystical beliefs. But what they did believe in was legacy. So now, how does that change us? And let me stop the share now. There we go. Well, it occurred to me that this is the opposite of egotism, the opposite of selfishness, because if you act now as if everything you do is part of your legacy to have your name whispered on the lips of somebody 3,500 years from now, 5,000 years from now, your kids, your grandkids, how far down the line you go, you delay that second death. Maybe you gain immortality, and immortality is that second death. Immortality has been the, the, the brass ring, you know, the stuff of legends, and, and probably one of the most reoccurring themes in both sci-fi and fiction because we have a fear of death. Like, especially if you made it well in this life, you don't really want to give it up. Um, if you've ever been to Los Angeles, there's a museum called the J. Paul Getty Museum, which has the biggest and most beautiful plot of land in Los Angeles with 360 views. And if you think about it, you know, that money, compound interest, has been sitting there for 150 years, which is why they can spend $80 million on a painting or a rock. And so if you had that sort of uh, ego to make that kind of money, you also have enough ego to want to never die. So are you saying that the Rockefellers and the, even the, you know, the Elon Musk of the world, you're saying that ego and, and second death is not a bad thing or it's a good thing? Because it yeah, feels I, like putting my name on a wall or a museum is really about me, not about my family. It just feels a little selfish but I'm jealous really want a library. Right. I think if you can act like you matter, like the story of you matters, like the story of Bart matters, then you start looking at things through a different lens and you stop worrying about the stupid little petty shit that people get tied up in. You're in the line to the fucking supermarket and the lady in front of you says, hey, man, you cut in front of me. The lady behind you is like, hey, man, you cut in front of me. And you know you didn't. But you're fucking King Tut. You have that 10,000 pound solid gold fucking sarcophagus. Are you going to worry about this little lady? No. You just smile and wave her, wave her in front of you. And it's fine. It's okay. You're magnanimous. You're big because you have a bigger story. That's what I'm saying. Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs famously in his uh, Walter Isaacson's uh, biography of Jobs said he would like to put a dent in the universe. And that's what he that's what he said to people when he invited them on. I think it was when he invited uh, Scully on uh, to come uh, help him run Apple. And, and he said, hey, do you want to come and put a dent in the universe with me? That's what he thought. That's what he believed. What's interesting is, in a source as we record this, Steve Jobs has passed on, but just last week it became the only company to ever be worth a certain amount of a billion. Was it a trillion dollars? It was. It was a. It was a landmark of any company in the planet. And if his mission was not to just get rich, if his mission was to make that much impact in the planet, it's fascinating that money chased him. And that's a good takeaway here because so many people toil for dollars and toil for ego and fame and front of the line. You hear it all the time in middle management, people backstabbing each other to get one little step up on the ladder. When here's a guy that just created a, a, a company that is now worth more than any company that's ever existed, in, at least in America, and his mission was never about money. It was about changing the planet. 
do we really all have the luxury of, of having that kind of value system, Shaheen? Can can I really do it? Can the listener really do it? It sounds sounds too big. That's the whole point. We feel like we're too small. And life has a way of dragging you down. Life has a way of just when you think you're ahead of the game, of putting you right back in your place. There's a great scene, one of my favorite scenes. I love watching this. Uh, uh, Godfather 3. So the Godfather played by, who now played by Al Pacino, he has cleaned the business. They're no longer in the murders and executions business. They're in the mergers and acquisitions business. And they're going to, in conjunction with the Pope, the highest holy man in the planet, going to start this company called Societa Immobilare. And Societa Immobilare is going to whitewash all of their bad deeds of the past. And his children's children and their children's children are all going to be legit. But wait. There's the other families that don't like that he's spearheading this. And they try to get him in. And there's this beautiful scene with Pacino. I know a lot of people don't like Godfather 3. And they don't even consider it one of the better, better godfathers. And I have to tell you, you call that whack. You call those people whack because they don't understand. That was always made as a series. And I think there might be a fourth one that Coppola is thinking of coming out with or has been talking about. So I'm excited to see that too. But with that said, Pacino does the scene where you look at his face and he goes, just when I think I'm out, they pull me back in. And of course, he's got to go in his old toolbox and – and get back into his old way of life again. And I think he has, is this the one where he, he discovers he has diabetes and has a heart attack or whatever, but you know, it all goes downhill. But the fact is life is like that. Life is not the way you see it in Disney movies. Life has a way of ebbing and flowing and there's highs and there's lows and, and you'll experience both of those things. But I'm just offering up as a thought that if you start thinking, Hey man, I have a legacy. Maybe I'm not a Rockefeller. Maybe I'm not going to be launching a big penis into space. Like those, those billionaires out there. <laughs> and seriously, dude, the, the, the one does look like a penis. I think it's, it's our boy Bezos. It, it definitely a 12 year old like could not miss the phallic symbol on that. It's <laughs> not, it wasn't even subtle. I, I, I just find this so amusing. I wouldn't have thought it was real because I thought I must be reading the onion. Like this cannot really be happening yet. That's what it, and you know, he had the conversation. He's like, you know what? I wanted to look just like that. That looks a lot like me. I'm Jeff Bezos and I approve this penis. That must have been the conversation that happened in the control room because well, you can't I, miss it. Yeah, <sighs> it's true. I know Musk uh, uh, publicly gone and said that his also looked like that, but he, he had a meeting with his engineers and they spent a lot of time and money making it pointy instead because he didn't <laughs> want it to look like that. So it's a it, metaphor it, for real life. I wonder if they've ever had some surgery. <laughs> you know what? We're going we're gonna to move on. We're going to move on. We're not talking about billionaires, peepees anymore. No, let's go on. Yeah, let's move on. So I think, I think it's just food for thought. If, if we all think to ourselves, hey, we have a legacy. There is something beyond us. You look at the greats. You look at Muhammad Ali. He wasn't fighting for himself. He was fighting for, for his legacy. He didn't not go to a, a war he didn't believe in just for his own good. He knew that people would watch his example, and he knew that he would live far beyond the time where his, his body, which eventually ended up being frail like the rest of ours, died off, that his story would be told and uttered on the lips of generations and generations. Now, we're not all going to achieve that, but imagine if we thought like that, if some of us thought like that, the, the things you would do would be bigger. The things you would worry about would be smaller, and the world would be a little bit different. Those two thoughts that come to mind, one is the idea of just perspective, and many, many people, in fact, my mom is always just amazed at how I never get ruffled. I don't really get stressed out about things, you know, and, and even before she was older, oh, it's a tire, it's a rent, we have mortgage coming up, we have taxes. And she's like, why do you never get upset about it? And, and I've tried to explain to her, I just have a perspective. 
in three years, this won't matter. In five years, it'll matter even less. And in 10, we won't even be talking about it. Like I've always had that wisdom to go, what's happening right now is not going to have the same emotional impact 10 years from now. You're taking it into generations, which is fascinating. And so the second thing that came to mind was an interesting study that they did on, of all people, poets. This is from the Wild Mind Meditation website. And it says, a study of language used by poets. And poetry is a very personal, like, I mean, if you're a poet, you're sitting around talking about a lot of interesting things, especially back in the 1800s. It was found that in the study of poets, it was found that those who used words like I, me, and mine were much more likely to commit suicide than the poets that more frequently used community words like we, us, and ours. And I thought it was fascinating. People just didn't even want to be here. They were so self-absorbed, they killed themselves. And then we go back to Maslow's RIP of needs, and we find that people, once they handle their food and their security and their relationships and sex needs, they start thinking about purpose and community and contribution. Those are the values that move you from like, oh my God, how do I feed my family to how do I feed the planet? Yeah. And what's so interesting is some of the people, even the people we just talked about, they might have originally started because they want to get it rich from PayPal or they wanted to get, but you know what? They're changing the planet in profound ways. I don't see anybody, we're, t- we're not talking about the Koch brothers. Like we're not talking about like, how do we take oil and extract it and take third world countries and bankrupt them? We're not talking about those people, which also, have a place in some conversation, but usually you're not going to get really, really wealthy creating a service that just molests the world. <laughs> I think you have to find something that changes it in a powerful way. I think you, that's pronounced Coke. I think Coke brothers. I think, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Either that one or of them died. One of them died, but C O C A the H is always very confusing to me. And and uh, Coke sounds like the soda, so I'm I'm trying to avoid any soda references for obvious reasons. Oh, yeah. yeah, those guys have an amazing story. You know, one of them bought these bottles of wine, like that he thought were from 1700s, 1800s. One that belonged to like Ben Franklin or something of whiskey or so- something like that. And it turns out that it was part of this uh, huge fraud of this dude, a. Uh, a gentleman that was, uh, d- you know, he was like ripping off labels and uh, he was like a master forger of wine. And there's a great documentary on Netflix about this guy, which is fascinating. But one of those yeah, guys as, bought- as one of the top forger experts in the world, that's, that's something that you should have told me about months ago. That sounds fascinating because we only encounter good forgers usually. It's somebody's mother passed away and they for- you don't get like, let's take Ben Franklin's wine. And mistress's yeah. letter, like that's good stuff. I could get it behind a show like that. Oh yeah, check out check out the check out the documentary on Netflix about I forget what it's called, but it's uh, it's fascinating about how this guy, uh, you know, manages to s- slide into the the world of high end wine. And what he did was initially he he started buying. He had some capital, so he bought like a few hundred thousand dollars worth of legitimate bottles of wine. And they thought, oh, he's a real player, and he's you know slid into the circles like that. And then he starts selling wine, and they're like, oh, well, he's buying it at these auctions. Turns out it was all fake. It was the biggest uh, biggest uh, uh, fraud in the wine industry ever. But all right, well, so well, and I'm gonna guess that he didn't end up with a legacy, and he probably ended up in prison, and he didn't end up with a great story at the end. But I haven't seen the documentary. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that's one way to have a legacy is to be infamous. That's definitely one way to to stay immortal. I mean, people do that all the time. That's why you have these like crazy serial killers. And sometimes, you know, there's copycats a lot of the time, which is a problem that the police have. I listen to the show called The Casual Criminalist, uh, Simon Whistler's show. Uh, one of the best, if you guys are into true, true crime, it's one of the greatest shows, and you can you can check that out. And he talks about like these serial criminals and kind of how they conduct their, their lives of crime. And there are copycats, and there's people who do that kind of stuff um, for infamy. So, yeah, it does, it does work both ways, but you know, definitely short-lived. And I'm hoping that nobody who's watching or listening to us or subscribing to our show is a psychopath. I would hope you are not a psychopath if you're watching this. But if you are, 
Now's a good. It's twenty uh, twenty two now. So New Year's resolution: don't be a psychopath. <laughs> I think there's plenty of shows that may have pulled their attention besides, besides this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, guys, as we're um, getting ready to wrap up, uh, this was a, a shorter episode for 2022, our first episode of the year. I want you guys to send us comments, comment below on what you would like us to see on the show, who you would like us to interview. If there's a product you'd like us to review, we are still in the mode of reviewing products and we will be reviewing a lot of really cool products. We've been looking at uh, biohacking devices, which I've been sent a ton of. We've been still looking at the CBD space and CBD oil, CBD rubs, everything having to do with CBD. Very interested in that. Electronic devices, gadgets, anything that can improve lives, we're interested in. So keep us informed about that. Um, and we'll also be talking about hacks of how you can make money, how you can break through the trap of the hamster wheel of selling your hours and step into a new era where you can create predictable recurring revenue on the Amazon platform. You like that part? Okay. So I've got a story. I'm not doing this just to show you playing. Is that real money or is that just the top two are real? Okay. Check it out. None of it's real. Okay. So you can order this on Amazon, by the way. Stacks of cash. Stacks of cash. Yeah. So you see these uh, uh, influencers, these YouTube influencers and like TikTok influencers, and they always have cash everywhere. Stacks of cash. Hey, look at this. Well, this one isn't that great. Look, that one doesn't look that, that good, but this one looks actually really good, right? except for the China stamp that's right on there. <laughs> this one looks really, really convincing. So it's funny. I ordered these. Guess where? eBay on Amazon. You can get them on eBay too. And they just, I'll send you a stack of these prop bills and it says copy on the back of them. So, you know, they're not real. They say copy and like different, different places. And it says not legal tender. So they do the minimum they need to, to make it seem not real. But I look, I wait for the Amazon guy to come and I have the, the service that Amazon offers where they can deliver right in your garage. So they have a, it's on their app. And the guy opens the garage door and I'm standing there. I'm like, hey, buddy, how are you? You want some water? I'm always super nice to him. Water, candy, juice, energy bars, whatever. I take care of those guys because I know how hard it is doing what they do. And the guy's like, yeah. I'm like, you never guess what I ordered. He's like, what? Nobody ever waits for the Amazon guy and then opens the package to show him. <laughs> He's really interested. Imagine this guy's delivering all these packages all day long. He doesn't see what's in any of them. So I'm like, I'm going to show you. You want to see? He's like, yeah. I'm like, guess. And he's like. I don't know. I don't know. He's like guessing like gloves, whatever. And I open it up and I just pull out a stack like this. <laughs> and he doesn't know what to expect. The guy's like, oh, he's like, he's like, nah. I'm like, yeah, man. And then I show him that it's, it's prop money, but it's funny guys. So don't believe everything you see. This is all. It's about ten dollars worth of, of fake. I want to throw a pitch for you because you have an Amazon course, and we were just talking about many of our friends who've gone through it, or my yeah. friends who went through your course and paid you the money, and they're all, and they're making money. And, and so I know that you've got an introductory course for our listeners. Uh, I'm going to give away a copy of my book, which is about half of the audiobooks finished, and I'll email it to you for free. But your Amazon course, to me, it's one of the the lowest hanging fruits or the lowest ways to get it. Doing what I do is kind of hard like to become certain things and write books and, and, and do thousands of radio shows. But starting an Amazon store, I think, can be done by the average person. So how do they get a hold of that course to find out if it's for them? Right. Okay, guys, it's 2022, beginning of the year. We are at day one, as Jeff Bezos says. There's no better time to start an Amazon business and let it create money for you while you are experiencing life, while you travel like I do. And from wherever the world you find yourself and your family, you can be creating predictable recurring revenue streams by becoming an Amazon seller. I've got a one hour course. It's normally $200. 
People have been asking me, why don't you charge a thousand bucks for it? Why don't you charge more? It's 200 bucks. Anybody that's listening to this, email me with the code 2022. And I will give it to you for free. My email, darkzess, D-A-R-K-Z-E-S-S at gmail.com. I will send you the 2022 Amazon Mastery Crash Course. And for any of you guys that are interested, my book, Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult, is out now. The Audible book is done, which Bart very lovingly nudged and encouraged me to do. So I'm, I'm delighted that the audio book is out on Audible. So please check that out and let us know what you think. Bart, if I'm interested in life design or life coaching, let's say from an expert who has worked with millionaires and billionaires in the past, how could I learn more about that? I was having a conversation with a a guy named Cole who just won Senate seat or, or legislatively in his home state of, of Dakota, 23 years old. And he just sat me and he's like, dude, can you give me any more advice on how to be successful? And I was like, uh, <coughs> I was like, oh, I just gave you 20. Read. And I said, look, I wrote a whole book on it. <laughs> I said, I don't want to be, don't be, but I wrote 435 page books. Can I just give you a copy? And he's like, man, I would love a copy. So I said, look, write down this URL. It's called success secrets of the rich and happy. Go to getbartsbook.com slash free. There's Get Bart's book. I've written two books that you guys can download for free slash free. That's the rich and happy book. And, and while I've got about half of it done, and, and maybe you can motivate me to finish up the other half of the audio book, it really covers all the financial and the mental foundations that I've used, and I think you've used too, to get from sort of an average life to a life where you're thriving. And so that's probably the first step is download that book, check out that. Eventually, we'll be opening up our life design programs for some other entries. But, you know, don't spend any money right now. I know you like us. I know I know the podcast is free. Keep tuning in. Do us a favor. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. When we come on live, you know, being your best friend and say, look, these two guys are interesting. And give us, you know, give us a little, a little love on that one. But uh, the getbartsbook.com slash free is the way to get into my world and our newsletters. And the Amazon Mastery FBA Seller. Did I get it right? FBA Seller Course.com. Bart, Perfect. say it a little bit slower, the email. So everybody gets it. So our URL is get Bart's book. So you know, three words. My name is Bart. So get Bart's book.com slash free. And then yours is, let me try this again FBA, which is, which is uh, fulfillment by Amazon. FBA. Mm -hmm seller.com am i right no fba seller course.com but fuck that just oh. email me much easier <laughs> guys just email me i respond to every single email it's dark as this at gmail.com d-a-r-k-z-e-s-s at gmail.com get bart's book reach out to us if you guys miss any of the stuff just reach out to us on shaheenshan.com or go to hack and grow rich on youtube comment on there we will share it with you we're going to send you off with a great article from Science Daily <laughs> entitled aptly, Why Does Jeff Bezos' Rocket Look So Much Like a Penis? We Asked a Rocket Scientist. Guys, for Hack and Grow Rich, this is Shaheen Shan. And I'm Bart Baggett. You guys have a great night, and thanks for tuning in.